<clears throat> Hello. Uh, uh, today we'll talk about two architects, very different, both connected uh, with uh, with this day of April. Johann Bernhard Fischer von Erlach, the great Austrian um, architect. And then we'll talk about a Dutch architect, himself a very important architect. But let's read a little bit about uh, Johann Bernhard Fischer von Erlach. He died actually on the 5th of April, and this is the reason why we talk about him today, because today is the 5th of April, but 2023, my God, my God, but today, today there are 400 years, no, 300 years, sorry for the bad mathematics, 300 years since Johann Bernhard Fischer von Erlach died. I didn't even realize that, uh, you know, there are three centuries since he died. Truly a remarkable architect. So again, Johann Bernhard Fischer von Erlach, born in July 1656 and died the 5th of April, 1723, exactly 300 years ago. Was an Austrian architect, sculptor, an architectural historian, those Baroque architecture profoundly influenced and shaped the taste of the, of the Habsburg, Habsburg Empire. His influential book, A Plan of Civil and Historical Architecture from 1721 was one of the first and most popular comparative studies of world architecture. A truly important architect. Here he was, uh, with a, with a wig that would make anyone impressive. Uh, and uh, I wonder why uh, uh, not just architects, but uh, you know, people in general, mostly men don't uh, wear wigs. I know I'm not an advocate of wigs. I, I'm joking in a way, but I wonder what made people then, uh, you know, so proudly, uh, you know, uh, using uh, these uh, emphatic, uh, forms of uh, fake fake hair. But look at the gesture of his hand, his right hand. You know, I wonder how many architects would have a similar gesture with a hand as um, um, Fischer von Erlach. Uh, I don't think too many. We know the, you know, the finger posture of uh, Frank Gehry, himself a very successful architect. If by success we mean you know, building a lot and uh, significantly, uh, but uh, with a very, very different kind of meaning. Uh, here we see an architect who uh, was uh, was uh, ready, so to speak, for debate. <clears throat> was was ready to <clears throat> discuss ideas and was ready to uh, promote ideas. Some drawings by this uh, very important architect. Uh, these are engraved drawings of uh, temples, monuments, uh, you know, ar an architecture that uh, stirred up his imagination and uh, that stirred up his, um, you know, knowledge of the history of architecture. Uh, he was a very knowledgeable, um, you know, uh, artist and intellectual, and uh, he didn't neglect the past. He was a Baroque architect, but but he he was very interested in in, in uh, all kinds of architecture that uh, animated uh, his uh, love for architecture, his belief in architecture. There is a little book, maybe there is also a large book. I have a small book, this very book that he published, a comparative architecture, and uh, shows clearly how how. Uh, uh, you know, inquisitive he was about uh, all kinds of architecture. So he made the drawings and based on these drawings, the, the engravings were made. But here we see, you know, his own uh, pencil drawings. Uh, this uh, the Karlskirche in, in, in Vienna, in Vienna uh, is uh, one of the most important buildings in Vienna and uh, rightly so, built by him. We are going to see the building. Karlskirche, Vienna. 
Was he an artist? Yes, he was an artist. He was also a sculptor. I mean, you know, what kind of architecture do we get when the architect is not also, at least also, an artist? He designed fountains, he did sculpture. We are going to see some of these things. Again, a page from that uh, book. He was even interested in the labyrinth. Even in uh, Oriental architecture. This only shows how curious he was and he didn't neglect anything about having to do with architecture as a true architect should do. Roman architecture, Oriental architecture, the labyrinth, the mythical architecture, you name it. Everything stirred up his imagination, his creative impulses. So even architecture that didn't exist any longer interested him. So he imagined it, like in this case, how it could have looked like. Now sculptures by Fischer von Erlach. Although there is another Fischer von Erlach, but with different first name, uh, his own son. In Prague, he did these sculptures, uh, these statues, and I wonder why we don't use ourselves statues in our buildings. And they could be even abstract sculptures. Why not? There was a reason why statues and sculptures animated buildings. I mean, Palladio's buildings, if we eliminate all the sculptural work that adorned them would be much less. And even in this case, if we remove the statues, the sculptures, do we get a better building? I don't think so. Because, I mean, this makes you stop and think and feel and ask questions and Thus, the richness of the building is higher, is increased. He did this fountain also, Fischer von Erlach. He did this one. So again, today there are 300 years since Fischer von Erlach died. We should remember this day, the 5th of April, 2023, exactly 300 years ago he died. Architecture, and he built a lot and he built well and some very important buildings. The Schönbrunn Palace, everybody knows about it. Well, he built it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, uh, a very important uh, uh, building in Vienna, uh, which has other important buildings, of course, but Schönbrunn is Schönbrunn. Uh, here we see some, I imagine, some renderings done by him. When once I visited this, um, this palace, uh, there was a marriage ceremony taking place in the palace. I couldn't enter, but I photographed. I, 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 I took many pictures through the windows on the first floor um, having to do with the marriage ceremony. It was very interesting. He also built, I, I'm not sure, but I think he also built this pavilion, which is on top of the hill. And, uh, on another day when I visited, it was raining hard and I, I, um, I found refuge 
uh, on this wing, on the right uh, wing, uh, as we look at, um, you know, it, it was it's open, you know, and uh, it was very very nice. I spent some um, contemplative uh, minutes here while it was raining hard outside. I'm nostalgic. Fischer von Erlach. Schönbrunn. Not far away from here, there is a, an interesting uh, um, subway station um, by Otto Wagner for the emperor. Vienna is so rich. This is the pavilion I told you about uh, on top of the hill. And it amused me to take pictures from the level of the grass towards that uh, eagle on top of the pavilion. I, I try to, it's too bad I don't have here those photographs, but uh, I remember how much I struggled to, to um, in a way, to bring that eagle to the level of the, of the, of the top of the, of the hill. And I managed to take some pictures where the, the building disappeared, not because I didn't like it, because I do like it. But I, I liked playing with the photography in which the eagle was, um, you know, uh, apparently touching uh, the top of the hill without seeing the building. I, I don't know if I, ex I expressed well what I wanted to express. Anyway, the Schönbrunn Palace. Here you see the relationship between the pavilion and the palace. And there are vast gardens, of course, The entrance is through here, and then all the way going to the entrance into the palace and so on. It's, it's a vast estate. I actually, I actually like more uh, Schönbrunn than, uh, than uh, Versailles. Now, we live at a time when still many people, although not all, all of them, uh, still practice uh, kind of a minimalist architecture. But we wonder, how come that 300 years ago and more than 300 years ago, architects had a different sensitivity? They wouldn't leave a flat ceiling impossible. No, they had to adorn it like here but you know there was art there, there was artistry there was the pleasure of uh, adorning the building in artistic ways and this animated the artistic spirit of the architects and the fountains or so uh, the earthiness you know uh, involved uh, involved uh, again the artistic instincts of the architect Of course, it's a special building. This is not social housing. But, but I think it's possible to, to, to find joy and, and, uh, and cultivate creativity and express creativity even with uh, much lesser money and with, uh, with uh, more modest uh, functions. I don't think we should forget beauty by any means. And I continue to think that beauty can be achieved even with much less money. I don't think it's a question of money. Now, he didn't build this. Uh, I like very much these, um, um, you know, uh, palm houses, palm and houses for, uh, for trees and vegetation and plants. But they were not built by uh, uh, Fischer von Erlach, although it's, it's a very impressive architecture. I like this picture very much. You know, it's it's uh, I don't know. It's somehow mysterious. I imagine that you are in the winter day. Now, Karlskirche in Vienna. I mentioned it, and it is one of the most important buildings in Vienna. Uh, it's it's a it's a formidable church. 
I only regret that once I saw in a window uh, a very nice engraving with Karl Kirche and I postponed to buy it and uh, I was afraid it would have been expensive but uh, when I decided to ask how much it was uh, and I, I imagine now it was not expensive actually it disappeared from the window some somebody else bought it but anyway this happens now here again you know we see the, the ecstatic qualities of uh, of um, uh, of the baroque art when i mean there is influence of course from bernini uh, but bernini influenced also frank gary uh, much more recently the plan is rather unusual uh, for the church uh, it's done brilliantly both the inside and the outside Fischer von Erlach, senior, because there is also a junior, but his first name is a little bit different. I'm always a little bit confused. Um, these unique columns are very unusual. You know, uh, we are not in Rome, the, in the Roman Forum. We are in Vienna. What do they have to do here? With But I think they work well with the building. Karlskirche, Fischer von Erlach, Exaltation, Spirit. It's very pleasant to walk by this church or to even bike around this church which I did, again, I'm nostalgic. And again, the importance of artworks, the importance of sculptures, the importance of, of statues for architecture. I think we should bring back, even in very avant-garde forms, art, painting, sculpture, media arts, whatever, architecture needs the manifestation, needs their expression. Otherwise, the building becomes frigid, sterile, dead. Austria National Library, also in Vienna, also Fischer von Erlach. You'll see the most impressive library. Look at this. It's a temple of books, or I could even say it's the church of books. They are intimidating, but they are also very, very uh, attractive. You know, they are, this is, uh, it was probably, uh, you know, the Imperial Library. I mean, who would go there to, to dislocate a book from the shelves? I mean, the interior is so impressive that uh, you have to absorb, you know, the, the emotions, the feelings that uh, are unavoidable, and uh, you even forget probably about the book. It becomes, uh, in a way, the books become walls. I keep... Uh, recalling that Victor Hugo said that the book killed the cathedral because once, once uh, the Guten, Gutenberg method of uh, printing uh, became uh, uh, used, uh, many books were generated and, and slowly but surely the message that was inscribed in uh, stained glass windows and in the walls, biblical messages, of course, in the walls of the cathedral were re replaced on the pages of the books. So in that sense, Victor Hugo was right. The book killed the cathedral. Well, here we see the book coming back to the wall, literally. And this happens even in uh, very contemporary uh, works like MVRDV uh, built a library. And not only them, 
where there is a book, the book seems to have the nostalgia of the world it left. Now here we have the worlds of knowledge and th these worlds of knowledge are of course uh, built, uh, well, they use constructive elements, but being surrounded by books, cushioned in books, covered with books, it is as if they are built with books, not with bricks or stones or something else. Of course, not all libraries can afford to be like this, but it is it's a magnificent, magnificent library. I don't think anyone can deny its beauty. It's like a church, the church of knowledge. It's almost, <laughs> You know, it's almost a, an anti-biblical message because if Eve and Eve, Eve if Eva and, and, and Adam were banished from the paradise because they uh, took a bite from the apple of knowledge, here we have through knowledge we make it back into into divinity in a way, into the divine aspect of life. So the library becomes a church or church-like or cathedral-like. If you make abstractions of the books, abstraction of the books, this is a cathedral. This is a church. Fischer von Erlach. 300 years ago, he died, but he didn't die. That's why we talk about him today, because he didn't die. Through his works, he is still with us, very much so. And he will continue to be with us even in our absence. That is, even after we will not be here any longer. This is the power of art. To transgress death. A palace in Vienna. Well, this is uh, another palace, a smaller one than Schönbrunn. And here we see the exaltation of the, uh, of the children, of the schoolboys. I love this picture, you know, because here we have, we have art in the back, architecture, and in the front we have the exaltation of life, of freedom, of movement, of joy. And then flowers, and then the building. The building a little bit uh, static compared to what we saw earlier, at least towards the outside. Fischer von Erlach. A look at the beauty of this uh, tree. Contorted as it is. Stratman Palace, Vienna, 1692. Uh, now uh, part of, uh, of the urban tissue. Maybe it's an embassy here or something, or maybe not. Uh, another palace, 1693. We're still in the 17th century. He died in the 80s. In 1723, he died, Fischer von Erlach, on the 5th of April, exactly 300 years ago. Sorry for repeating it. I love this kitchen. I mean, it's not a, for a proletarian, but I think even a proletarian would feel very, very good here. And I would too, although I never exalted the function of cooking uh, but I always neglected it. But here it's it's romantic. It's almost medieval. It's um, it's um, it's as it should be, I think. And it's vast. A whole atelier in a school of architecture could eat here together. These tables. Uh, you might need a few cooks here. Yes. 
but uh, it, it is very inviting. I can read, I don't know German, and I apologize, Salzburg, 1693. Salzburg has a special, uh, you know, uh, landscape, natural landscape. I remember the project that uh, done for a Guggenheim Museum by a, a very important uh, Austrian uh, modern architect, Hans Hollein, uh, which was not built, but it was uh, assuming the, <clears throat> this dramatic landscape of Salzburg. <clears throat> By the way, <clears throat> Hans Hollein was the first Austrian architect who received the Pritzker Prize in architecture. But I'm almost sure that uh, Austria will get other uh, such prizes because it has formidable artists and architects like Fischer von Erlach and Hans Hollein and many others. It's a country which has the population, half of the population of Romania, but has a very large number of uh, impressive uh, artists and architects and writers and uh, so on. Uh, culture in Austria is uh, of the first uh, order. St. Mark's Church in Salzburg, 1699. Fischer von Erlach again. Another palace, 1700. Now, unfortunately, I would say it's a casino there. Maybe I'm a moralist. But uh, I was even thinking uh, today, reading the news about Donald Trump, who owns cas casinos. And I would say that um, a man, the man is as honest as the casinos are. And casinos are not honest. I myself lost one some money in a casino. Uh, so, you know, I, I cannot imagine a very honest man owning a casino or owning a business with casinos. Because casinos are taking advantage of the weakness of people who dream of getting quickly rich and they lose their money, you know, playing whatever inside the casino. Anyway, Holy Trinity Church, again in Salzburg, 1694-1702. Beautiful trees in the spring, probably. Here the spring is a little bit uh, hesitant at this point. Another church, again in Salzburg. How many churches did he build in Salzburg? And this is the fourth one I show. And they're all good, now, architecturally speaking. Now, it could become a rare event. The Franciscan Church, the Franciscan Church High Altar in Salzburg. I love this picture, but I'm a little bit confused. Where is it? Because... Um, 
this picture I love. I mean, the architecture is very impressive and the insertion of the artwork, the sculptural artwork is uh, only amplifying the drama of architecture around it. It's coherent, it's logical, but it's dramatic, it's emotional, it's powerful. Another palace in Vienna this time, too white for my taste, but uh, I'm sure there is some, some emotional uh, architecture inside. No cars, but carriages in this engraving. Was it white at the time of uh, Fischer von Erlach? I don't know. The Chancellery in Vienna, 1708-1714. Here we see pink as an unexpected color, especially for uh, you know this kind of function, uh, uh, governmental. Another palace, I hesitate to pronounce it. seems unfinished at the, in the middle. Stolberg, uh, Stolberg uh, 1723. I don't know what this is. It's in Vienna. And here we have the, the, the father and the son, both architects. The one we are paying homage to today is the one on the left. But on the right, we have uh, his son, also Fischer von Erlach, but with a uh, uh, different uh, first name. Instead of Johann, uh, is Joseph Emanuel Fischer von Erlach. And I'm going to show a work he built in Timisoara in Romania, a church. Is this one? He also built, I read, but I didn't see it, uh, a castle somewhere in Transylvania. But this is the church that the son of Fischer von Erlach built in Timisoara, which uh, this year has the honor of being uh, the cultural uh, European culture, European culture capital uh, for 2000s. Um, not sure if it's not delayed one year. 2022 or 2023, but it happens this year. So this is a very important building within Timisoara, built by the son of uh, 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 the great architect we paid homage to today, 300 years after he died. Thank you. Now we'll talk about the second architect uh, associated with uh, uh, this day. And this is a very important uh, Dutch modern architect and let's uh, let's read a little bit about him born, born in 19 in 1890 philip johnson the C, the sixth lord of architecture would cite three mo moments that turned him towards the profession a visit to Chartres cathedral as a 13 years old a visit to the parthenon in 1928 and a small row of worker, ha, workers' houses in the Höck van Hollen by JJP Oud. And we are talking about this very architect today. So he was born uh, on, uh, on uh, the 9th of February, but like uh, Fischer von Erlach, he died on the 5th of April, 1963. So he died uh, um, 60 years ago exactly 60 years ago, while Fischer von Erlach died exactly 300 years ago. He was a Dutch architect. His fame began as a follower of, of the Stel movement. Oud, uh, I hesitated a little bit and probably you noticed in pronouncing the Stel, I, I used to pronounce it the Stil, but I read uh, on, uh, there is a website which tells you how to pronounce correctly. And apparently the, the correct pronunciation is the Stel. Oud was born in Pulmerand, uh, the son of a tobacco and wine merchant. 
as a young architect, he was influenced by Berlache and studied under Theodor Fischer in Munich for a time. He worked together with Dudok, a great Dutch um, architect, one of the fathers of modernism in, in, in this incredible uh, country in terms of architecture, and not only architecture, which the Netherlands is. But um, uh, Oud uh, uh, met Theo van Deusburg, who together with Piet Mondrian, uh, you know, founded uh, the Bichtel movement. And uh, Oud became part of that movement. Between 1918 and 1933, Oud became municipal housing architect for Rotterdam. During this period, when many laborers were coming to the city, he mostly worked on so socially progressive residential projects. This included projects in the areas of Spangen, Kiefhoek, and uh, the with, uh, with, uh, Dorp. Oud was one of a number of Dutch architects who attempted to reconcile strict, rational, so-called scientific, cost-effective construction technique against the psychological needs and aesthetic expectations of the users. His own answer was to practice poetic functionalism. Well, functionalism, if it wants to survive, it better be poetic. Otherwise, we could say goodbye to it. In 1927, he was one of the 15 architects who contributed to the, uh, the influential, um, I cannot read because the text is covered by something here from Zoom, but I imagine it's the Weissenhof exhibition. In uh, America, Oud was perhaps known for being lauded and adopted by the mainstream modernist movement, then summarily kicked out on stylistic grounds, and you'll understand later why this happened. As of 1932, he was considered one of the four greatest modern architects, along with Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, and Le Corbusier. Can you imagine? So Oud was together with Mies, Gropius, and Le Corbusier, considered one of the four greatest modern architects in 1932, and was proeminently featured in Philip Johnson's International Style Exhibition. Johnson maintained a correspondence with Oud, tried to help him get work, commissioned a house for his mother, never built, and sent him socks and bicycle tires. Very moving and amusing. In 1945, after the end of World War II, allowed photographs of Oud's 1941 Shell Headquarters building in The Hague to be published in America. The architectural press sarcastically condemned his use of ornament, embroidery, in quotation marks, as contrary to the spirit of modernism. This is what people thought and felt at that time. After World War II, Au designed the Dutch National War Monument in Amsterdam and the monument of the military war cemetery Grebeberg. By then, he had mostly let go of any stale influences. He continued to take a highly individualistic stance against mainstream modernism. He designed projects such as the Sparbank in Rotterdam, office building, the Utrecht in um, Rotterdam, and the Children's Health Center in Arnhem. Uh, Oud's brother, Peter Oud, was mayor of Rotterdam. This helped, of course. Oud died in 1963 at the age of 73 in this place, by the side. So this was the man, the man who stirred up the imagination of uh, Philip Johnson and uh, who uh, was able to influence him to study and practice architecture, it seems, after the Parthenon, Charter Cathedral, and Oud. Can you imagine the force of this man to make Philip Johnson be moved towards architecture together with the Parthenon and uh, Chartres Cathedral? in all the rage when he gave up his um, Dichtel uh, uh, longings, the architecture of J.J.P. Out, 1906-1963, some drawings by him, uh, furniture, of course, an architect when he doesn't have any commissions, 
draws chairs and nobody can stop you uh, doing so. And uh, here we see clearly the influence of uh, Dichtel. They were artists, they were architects, they were artists. I mean, uh, you know, Theo van Dersburg, he also built, he also painted. Uh, Piet Mondrian didn't build, but, but, but he was part of the group. And, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't just a quest for, uh, for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, a new art form. It was uh, a form of idealism that assumed art in a certain way, but also it was perhaps also a, a spiritual quest for purity, for innocence, for a, a new beginning, a fresh beginning. This building was built and we are going to see it. Now, this is a portrait of Oud made by Theo van Dersburg. <laughs> you know, um, you see clearly the, the influence of uh, ideas that uh, uh, the Stil was uh, based on, or the Stel. I myself um, forget sometimes how to pronounce correctly, and I, I am still a little bit unsure how to pronounce it. Um, a house that he built. I have great difficulties to pronounce um, words in, in Dutch, but this is the house. This was the house, and we are going to, to see it um, uh, again. Uh, here it is. JJP out. It looks good even when uh, it looks uh, not inhabited almost uh, some kind of a uh, still standing ruin, perhaps after the war or during the war. But this is how it is now, it survived. Now you see clearly, this is uh, modernism. This is uh, what uh, you know Hitchcock and Philip Johnson would have expected from a so-called international style. But was our truly an international style architect? I'm not so sure. Worker housing in Rotterdam, 1918. 1918, more than 100 years ago, 105 years ago, he built this, uh, you know, uh, worker housing in Rotterdam. No, I'm sorry. This cannot be 1918. Uh, or is it? It looks, I'm confused. 1918. It's possible it is 1918, but uh, I, I find it revolutionary. I mean, this was even before the birth of uh, the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus came into being in 1919. Then Le Corbusier built Villa Savoie in 1927 28. 1928. So, so I, I imagine, I understand now correctly why Johnson was so moved by the early works of JJP out. And look at this 105 years ago to be like this. If you be like this today, all the the e signs and magazines and so on and blogs would publish the work, and it would consider it uh, highly contemporary and so on. And this was done at the end of the First World War, 1918. Amazing, uh, truly amazing. I mean, look at the lamps and look at the buildings. Yes, it was 1918. For a second, I thought it was the number on the street. No, it was the year when this was built. I still don't believe it. This is an architecture clearly revolutionary for 1918. Very much so. But the Bauhaus was not even born in, in the year when out built in this way. 1920-1921. Somehow, what he did in 1918 looked more revolutionary than and more uh, modern, so to speak, than what we look at here.
I like the fact that this architect devoted his time and talent and interest to social housing. I think it's always good to see talents in architecture working for those less privileged. Garden Village in Rotterdam, again, 1922. Now this one shows, you know, some flirtation, so to speak, with the past because of the sloping roofs. It still exists. This reminds me of the house that Hans Wagner, the King of Chairs, was born in Copenhagen. I'm not sure if in, I think in Copenhagen, in Denmark, and if not in Copenhagen, in some other city, but in Denmark, at a very similar, uh, uh, you know, building. This is how it looks like today. The village, in that it is a village. A look at the proud uh, modernistic uh, towers in the background. Must be very nice to have such a so-called rural house inside a city like uh, Rotterdam. A luxury. So we didn't build just one house. There are many, as you can see, it's a, it's a large area covered with these houses. It's a village within the city. Out. Now this uh, very well-known uh, cafe in Rotterdam from 1925, two, three years before uh, Le Corbusier built Villa Savoie, but here we see color. Uh, not uh, not much color in Villa Savoie, though Le Corbusier loved color and was a painter as well. But sometimes he avoided it, color in his architecture. Not, not the case here. Here color is present with and within architecture. In the spirit of Dichter. JJP out. The building still exists, just as you see it. A digital statement. I hesitated to use the word manifesto. Maybe it was also a rather modest interior. Nothing wrong with modesty or modest interiors at all, actually. But the spirit of the avant-garde, the freshness of their longings for a new beginning are shown in the, in the elevation, the front elevation of the, of the building. JJP uh, Out, Cafe Rotterdam, 1925. What is that limousine doing in front of the buildings? Why not? Workers' houses, again, 1926-1927. Here he assumes also curves, architecturally speaking, and uh, convincingly so. He's very good with this horizontal architecture. I am sure Philip Johnson was impressed too by it. JJP out. Red doors, why not? They look good on white backgrounds.
Now, a row of five houses in Stuttgart at the Weissenkopf colony, where the master plan was designed by Mies van der Rohe and important architects took part. This is a very important uh, um, architectural colony of uh, houses um, and housings. 1927. This is what uh, Oud uh, built, and I think is one of the best uh, architectures there. And there are other formidable, I, maybe I shouldn't use such an inflated word, but other very good architectures there, including Le Corbusier, uh, Hans Sharun, um, uh, Hans Hartung. Mies himself built besides the, doing the design for the master plan. Excellent uh, work by Oud in Stuttgart, in Germany. There was a lot of concern for, for um, you know, houses. Row houses, social housing, uh, little villages, uh, you know, houses for workers, you name it. There was uh, the social component of architecture interested architects. And I think this was very uh, uh, to be appreciated as it should be today too, if we don't forget to also build for those who are not necessarily rich. So this is in Stuttgart in Germany. Now, 1938-1948, the Shell headquarters in The Hague, uh, <laughs> He began to be, you know, uh, criticized because he uh, gave up apparently some of the, you know, the the ideals of uh, Tichtel and uh, you know so-called international style. And uh, let's read a little bit about it. The shell building by JJP Oud was a building that was both ahead and behind the times when it was built a building that irrevocably damaged the reputation of its designer for the crime of adding ornamentation, but perhaps, uh, but has perhaps unfairly not been reappraised since it, it was finished. Uh, it's true, the, the plan of the building is, uh, you know, perfectly symmetrical, and it's, uh, you know, it's almost a bazaar plan, I would understand the, the astonishment of the critics, but it remains to be seen how this building might be reappraised, if it will be reappraised sometime from now. Yes, something like this was considered unacceptable at that time, but uh, I don't know, is it a crime? I will let you ponder uh, on this. Sparbank, 1942-1957, Rotterdam. Here again, we have uh, accusations coming at uh, JJPO that he used uh, you know, ornaments, we see the round uh, windows and uh, in, uh, some other parts, uh, a different sensitivity from uh, the early uh, purity of uh, the uh, digital influences. Another building, 1952-1960. Uh, the sculptural work is not his, but the building is, and it's still more modernistic. But uh, as we as we noticed, uh, he was, um, you know, uh, criticized for, uh, you know, mellowing down, so to speak, by by accepting some form of ornamentation 
very discreet, in my opinion, in his work. Although now, in, um, in the year 2023, ornament is returning to architecture. Maybe the works of uh, JJP Oud will be reconsidered, the later works. An office building from 1954-1961, also in Rotterdam. Not too much ornamentation here, if at all. But yes, yes. Looking back, uh, we could see, we could see why you know the, the 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 stringent whiteness and purity of lines and volumes of uh, of that magnificent work from 1918 um, gave place to um, you know an architecture of, uh, which appears to be to an extent uh, re less uh, revolutionary and uh, perhaps. Uh, the result of some compromises, maybe. Now, a national monument from 1956 in Amsterdam. Let's not forget, in Amsterdam existed a contrary movement to the, the Stel movement, and that was the School of Amsterdam with a very valid uh, uh, and interesting architecture. Very, very different from what uh, the uh, Theo van Dersburg uh, group uh, promoted. I strongly suggest uh, we investigate the architecture of the School of Amsterdam, which is uh, which has some remarkable buildings uh, in its uh, CV, so to speak. Anyway, he did, did here just the architecture of the monument, not the statues. Maybe there is some influence here. I see. Uh, some echoes perhaps coming from Rodin. I don't know if this lion is, is part of that um, ensemble, uh, but uh, anyway, a monument, not in Rotterdam, but in Amsterdam. The cities are very different. It is said that Rotterdam is the city of the future and Amsterdam is the city of the past, but it's not quite so. There are some innovative buildings being built in Amsterdam and even uh, what the School of Amsterdam built was very innovative and creative. But Rotterdam is true because it was destroyed by war in good measure, or not, I should not say in good measure, in large measure, because it was not good at all. I am sorry for the choice of the word had to you know, start anew while Amsterdam was not destroyed. As a designer, I will show a few things by JJP out, an interesting lamp, not much ornament here, unless we consider that sphere, some kind of a surreal or surrealistic ornament which has also, I imagine, I like to imagine maybe, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it has a function. I don't think it does. Well, probably it does to keep the lamp, uh, you know, balanced. An armchair. Is this poetic functionalism? Well, moderately poetical, uh, but it is, um, you know, a uh, functional armchair, yes. Another armchair. He was a good designer. And yes, architects love to do chairs. It's true. So many of them. Now, this one might not be the most comfortable chair in the world. These are almost the colors of the Ukraine flag, no? Maybe we should send such a chair uh, as a gift to Vladimir Putin to create some uh, remorse in him although I doubt that he will have it. 
what if uh, let's imagine vladimir putin uh, sitting on such a chair by jjp out with the colors of the ukrainian flag or maybe this is exactly what he wants unacceptable that war it has to end and this is i think his own uh, gravestone very surprising. I don't know if he had anything to do with the design, but you wouldn't expect this kind of gravestone for the architect who designed that uh, complex of buildings in 1918. A different man, indeed. But it's again, it's very possible he didn't have anything to do with, uh, with this uh, small monument of the Domus Eterna, where he is buried. But I don't know. Thank you.